Okay, welcome everyone to this week's Symmetry Seminar. It's a pleasure to have Wenji here, and she's going to tell us about uh, symmetry uh, topological order correspondence. Please take it away, Wenji. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning from California. Uh, today, I will talk about this uh, topic we call, I call it uh, symmetry topological order correspondence. So, what is this? So, it's uh, mainly we will talk about a proposal that's in, been put forward in recent years by a couple of groups. And essentially, it's talking about that uh, it proposed that a complete description of discrete symmetries is going to be a topological field theory. So uh, the essence is that uh, traditionally we when we describe symmetries, we emphasize a lot about symmetry charges. But this proposal says that we should also um, emphasize the role played by symmetry defects. And uh, the complete uh, through a complete description of both of them uh, will be a topological field theory. And those uh, symmetry charges and symmetry defects will appear in the topological field theory as uh, topological defects. Now, this is a very bold pro proposal, and it's a very non-trivial effort to unfold this proposal. And uh, based on well, where what's your background, you might unfold it in different ways because you care about them in different aspects. For us as a, a low energy physicist, we care most because um, we want, uh, the best hope from this proposal is that the symmetry charges, defects, and all the dynamics associated with them can be predicted using this uh, corresponding topological orders in one high dimensions. And in particular, using the knowledge of topological order, we're going to be able to predict the phase diagram associated with the symmetry. And uh, that's why we care about them as a condensed matter physicist. And then there's, if you are a high energy physicist or a mathematician, um, you care about some other aspects. And in particular, in their own words of these uh, mathematicians, they care about it because they think that all the abstract data of symmetries are going to be encoded by a, a, a topological field theorist. And any quantum field theories that has a symmetry is just a concrete realization of those uh, data. Now, uh, this like statement sounds very profound, um, and it, it actually involves a very deep uh, math mathematics. But in this talk, um, what I I want to share with you is our take upon this uh, proposal as a condensed matter physicist. So let me start with our basic setting. When I talk about this correspondence, it's uh, at the microscopic level, it's a, a, it's a like very concrete uh, equivalent, uh, equivalence between two uh, quantum models. So on the left side, it's uh, any quantum models in D dimension that is associated with a discrete symmetry. So the symmetry is a key feature here. Like you can think about uh, any Hamiltonians that can mute with a global operator, say this U operator. And what it does, for example, on a spin model is to flip the spins from all up to down and down to up. And then on the right-hand side, what I mean, it's a going to be a quantum model in D plus one dimension. And this model, it has no symmetries, but it has a topological excitations. And in our uh, community, we call this a topological order. So you can think of uh, the Tori code model, which is popular uh, in recent years because Google's uh, experiments, it's one of this example. It's the simplest uh, uh, topological order, which we call a Z2 topological order. So that's the uh, setting, the broad stroke. Let's go one step further. What I mean by this correspondence is like at microscopic, it means that uh, uh, these two side of models, there's a isomorphism between them. And in particular, on the right-hand side, I won't talk about this whole uh, model in D plus one dimension. I will talk about the uh, boundary model of this topological order. 
So take any dimensional uh, top, topological order, and then we send the bulk to the ground state. And that means uh, there is no excited state in the bulk. If you happens to create some excitations, this uh, the excitations will live on the boundary. So we will have microscopic models that describe those uh, dynamics of those excitations only happen on the boundary. And then this boundary model will be a D-dimensional models. We can, uh, so we are going to have uh, two side of our correspondence, both is a D-dimensional models. And our claim is that we can uh, derive isomorphism from the left side to the right-hand side and vice versa. And this uh, then under a small condition, uh, which uh, I labeled as U equals, uh, uh, U equals to one here. So this is a mild and technical condition. Essentially like to derive this isomorphism, I need to compare the Hilbert space between the two sides. And on the left side, uh, I don't count every state in my traditional uh, model with uh, symmetry. I only counting those states that carries trivial charge under my symmetry. So this is just a technical condition. You don't really need to care about it until you care about this uh, equivalence at that most precise level. But any predictions you want to make about say the phase diagrams, like what kind of uh, symmetry charges can condense together, it's uh, irrelevant to this condition. So to the zero order, you can just forget about this condition. This uh, two-sided model are equivalent. A model with a discrete symmetry and the boundary model of a topological order. So I will explain this uh, in through uh, uh, examples later, but here's the uh, plan of my talk. So first I will review this isomorphism I mentioned uh, quickly. And then uh, like as we begin to trust this uh, correspondence, I want to talk about uh, its consequence as more my macroscopic levels. And I want to describe things in space-time picture. And those uh, topological excitations in the bulk topological order, um, in the space-time picture, it becomes topological lines in the bulk topological order. And I, I will explain to you how those topological, uh, topological lines becomes a global uh, con uh, constraints on the boundaries. And then uh, on the other hand, if a system has a, a symmetry, in space-time, uh, you, you, uh, you can insert symmetry defect in this theory. And then in space-time, this becomes, uh, this world line of these defects become um, symmetry lines in the space-time. And the first the main point I want to make in this talk is that actions of those symmetry lines is going to be equivalent to the actions of those topological lines through this correspondence. I will explain uh, that in quite detail. And then we'll move on to like talk about what's the use of this uh, correspondence. I will show you that um, we can use it to predict dynamics, especially the dynamics at phase, to, uh, phase transitions, because that's the, uh, that's the part that um, uh, we know most less uh, currently. And there are going to be some uh, phase transitions that uh, is beyond the Landau description. And uh, I will show you through one example in 1D that we can completely solve, use this uh, correspondence. So that's the uh, second part of my talk. And then final, uh, finally, I want to talk about uh, like a technical uh, result, um, more, more complicated results than the previous two. It's like, I will talk about um, in, uh, uh, in critical, uh, in critical theories, uh, at critical point, we usually describe them using conformal field theories. And I will uh, uh, show you how uh, how we can like translate the action of symmetry lines on conformal field theories to the actions of topological lines in conformal field theories. There is quite some uh, a more complicated case in that in that uh, in that uh, topic. So let me move on. So first, it's a quick review about this uh, correspondence at macros a microscopic level. Um, as I have mentioned, it's a 
uh, the left side is the quantum model with a symmetry. So let's pick the simplest example. That's the quantumizing model in a transverse field. I describe it in one plus one D, but this uh, uh, isomorphism works in any dimensions. So we have a IC model in a transverse field. It has this uh, Z2 symmetry. Um, by the way, can you see my curse? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, we have a Z2 global symmetry that's generated by this uh, uh, product of poly X operators. And in particular, we only consider this Hilbert space so that this U acts as an identity. And for example, this uh, so-called cat state, the all, uh, spin, all, uh, spin all up state plus spin down state. This is one of the ground state in the symmetry breaking uh, phase. And this, uh, this cat state is actually also symmetric under this uh, symmetry operation. So it's also included in my Hilbert space. So that's the left side. And then on the right hand side, the simplest topological order is what we call this uh, top, uh, toric-code topological order. So it's uh, some uh, quantum model defined on the two dimensional lattice uh, and uh, with some local terms. It has two types of local terms in the Hamiltonian. One is this uh, A type of plug, uh, A time starter involving product of poly, four poly X operators. And the other is this um, um, a plaque term, a B term, that's a product of, of, of all Z operators. So um, to the level I care about, I will put the bulk uh, to the ground state. So all these uh, uh, bulk Hamiltonian terms, they all commute with each other and I can send them all to uh, one in the same time. This is defines my ground state. And uh, then, to de describe this uh, boundary, uh, uh, boundary dynamics, I create, uh, I can create those uh, topological excitations. Because this is a review, I'm just uh, describing it uh, briefly. And uh, usually the dynamics of toric code involves the dynamics of two uh, uh, par uh, basic particles. One is this E particle, and the other is this uh, M particle. It can also be generated by those uh, product of poly X uh, uh, and poly Z operators. For example, this is a single Z operators, it's generate uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, E type uh, excitations and uh, this uh, string of poly X operators, it generates this uh, M type of um, ex uh, ex uh, topological excitations. And I, uh, um, I uh, put those terms in my boundary Hamiltonians and weighted by some coupling constant. And this describes the dynamics um, uh, between uh, a fluctuation of these uh, E particles and M particles. Then, um, then we proved in like uh, concretely that this uh, whole left model, there's a isomorphic map from the left to the right. Any states on the left can be mapped to a state on the right, and uh, this Hamiltonian. All any uh, local terms in this Hamiltonian is mapped to another local terms uh, on the Hamiltonian on the right. And if two terms are like neighboring each other on the right left hand side through this isomorphic, they are still neighboring each other on the right hand side. So this isomorphic also preserves the locality in both models. So that means we can trust this uh, isomorphism um, completely. Okay. So that's a, a quick review of this example. And because like this uh, map is between all the local operators involved in these models, so we can like easily build up a dictionary between low energy excitations. And on the left hand side, those low energy excitations means those uh, operators that generate symmetry charges or symmetry uh, defects such as domain walls. And on the right hand side, it means the op local operators that generates those uh, topological excitations. And then using that dictionary, of course, you can also map uh, match the phase diagram from the both sides and they match perfectly. And then this isomorphism, uh, we show that uh, uh, it works for all the uh, lattice gauge theory with a billion uh, discrete gauge uh, group G in any dimensions. 
And then uh, in current days, you also have generalized symmetries. The charges can be loops or it can be restricted to some subspace. Like, so it becomes some, we have some, uh, I see a question. Go ahead. Hi, oh, this is Juben. Just make, make sure a uh, previous slide on the boundary of uh, this uh, 2 plus 1D topological order, somehow you have Hamiltonian introduced also J and H. How is uh -huh. the J and H introduced? How is the uh, J and H come up? Yes. This two just uh, uh, real uh, coefficients that describe uh, the energy penalty to create each uh, excitations. So. Uh, and this will be particular choice. Mm, it's a generic choice. You can put any coefficient for J and H. And this will be one type of a uh, boundary for two plus one D Z two. Yes. Yes. Order. But, yeah. but by the, in certain limit, you will go to E condensed or M condensed type of boundary, gap boundary. Right, order. right. Uh huh. Okay. So, so I can explain a bit more. So, okay. this boundary, you see that there's a two coefficient J and H, and then the the, the, the real parameter is, uh, is the ratio of the, the two, only the ratio of the two it makes sense, like it's important. And then you have a phase diagram that has a single, uh, depending on a single parameter, J over H. Then there is two, you have a phase diagram, now there are different phases. In one limit, J is, great, uh, J is much bigger than H. That means this uh, first term, the J term dominates. And that, that means the ground state essentially is that all these Z terms equals to one. And since Z, single Z creates this E type particles, so E type particle is condensed in this limit, in this phase. And in the other hand, if your H is greater, much bigger than J, then this M particle is condensed. So in this phase diagram, you have two limits. One is E condensed, the other is M condensed. Then there's a phase transition between the two. And that's also what is uh, uh, analogously happened on the left-hand side. You have an icing model. There are two limits in this one dimensional phase diagram. When J is great, uh, when J is very large, you have a symmetry breaking phase. When H is very large, you have symmetric phase. And then there's a phase transition between the two. And this isomorphism between uh, saying that for whichever value J of H, you have mapped to a particular model on the right hand side with a particular J and H. And the use notation I wrote here, actually those values also match exactly. Does that answer your yeah, question? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there also a particular way that J H are determined from the bulk point of view? Or is there just a choice that uh, you can just choose arbitrary J and H? I, I guess well, probably there's to describe the full dynamics. We we can uh, we just need to allow all the J and H so they have a face a, a face diagram on the boundary, but in traditionally people care most about so called gapped boundaries of topological orders. So you always choose some uh, some exact solvable limit, and that's this J goes to infinity limit and H goes to infinity limit. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. So yeah, so this uh, isomorphic works for all the lattice gauge series with a billion discrete group G in any dimensions. And uh, we can also generalize to the cases that the symmetry are involved in this higher form symmetries and subsystem symmetries. And uh, we also prove concretely that for this uh, Z2 type uh, uh, generalized symmetries, uh, uh, we also establish this isomorphic. Uh, essentially, if you give me a quantum model with a Z2 type generalized symmetry, it can output you a topological order model. And then the boundary is like corresponding to the model you give me. So this is not the main topic of this talk. So I'll just mention here briefly. And then I will move on to like a more macroscopic level uh, consideration about this correspondence. In particular, I care about the critical points. For example, in the Tori code model, I will uh, fine tune that J over H to some particular model, a particular point that right, really describe the transition between this E condensed phase and M condensed phase. 
And on the left hand side, I will fine tune the IC model to this uh, critical point that uh, that that is described as symmetry breaking transition. So then I will uh, compare the low energy spectrum between these two sides of the models at critical point. And how we do that in uh, like most uh, completely is like we can list it out like uh, all the low energy excited, uh, spectrums. And uh, technically we do, uh, we do this by writing this uh, spectrum in terms of a torus partition function. So because the uh, two sides of model are all one dimension, so in space time, I will have a torus. Um, and then I can formally write this kind of partition function that uh, depending on a particular formal parameter, which we call tau, it's uh, the real, uh, it's like in call this length of this, uh, uh, this uh, quantum chain and also the imaginary uh, temperature. Imaginary time of this torus. And then you can see that through this uh, uh, expansion, essentially this partition function encodes all the energies, uh, energy epsilon for each uh, state and also the momentum of each state, Pj. So it's a complete, uh, it's a way to completely record all the low energy uh, uh, spectrums. For example, this uh, critical point in IC models, I can tune this to the critical point at uh, J equals to H. And then this uh, partition function will be those appearing in this icing conformal field theories. Um, especially it can be organized into three towers of states. And in uh, within each tower, there's the most lower, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, state with the most lowest energy. Um, for example, um, like they had some formal names like the uh, vacuum and the sigma state and the Poisson state. So uh, this world we can like have a completely uh, handle about this uh, low energy spectrum. And then we can do the same thing to describe the boundary of uh, topological orders. And so in, in this way, how we can have a torus, like remember we have put our block to the ground state. There's no dynamics on, the, on it. And then uh, on the boundary, you have a circle. Through, the, uh, through this uh, time evolution, we have uh, another time direction. So this uh, boundary of this solid torus is another torus. And uh, uh, we will describe our partition function on, on this uh, torus with the formal parameter tau. And for example, in this historical example, uh, I, when I fine tune it to the critical point and I can work out all the low energy uh, states in, on this boundary. And in this case, what I found is that the low energy states are also described by the states appearing in the icing conformal field theory, but now there are only two towers. So what's the difference here? Is, uh, these are different. These uh, low energy lying states are different under the action of the symmetry, the Z2 symmetry. So in particular, these two uh, states, it's appearing in my boundary of topological order. They're uh, even uh, under the Z2 symmetry action. This one and Poisson, they carry a trivial charge under Z2. And then this uh, sigma uh, state, which only appear in the, I, uh, in the IC model, but haven't appeared in my uh, toric uh, uh, tori code boundary. It uh, carries a uh, uh, minus one charge under this uh, global symmetry Z2. Excuse me. Uh, can, mm -hmm. can you set U equal to minus one by putting a, a topological defect uh, and making it end on the boundary? Or can you only access the the symmetric Hilbert space in your construction? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I will, I will, uh, we'll get to there soon. Like I will talk about the case that uh, U equals to minus one sector also appears. So now let's just uh, still uh, we keep ourselves within this U equals one sector. So what I have said that 
those uh, we will we can compare the low energy spectrum between the two sides of the correspondence through how the states are uh, carries what charge under the symmetry. So on the uh, uh, so both sides at the critical point, it's the ice in conformal field theory that uh, sh shows up. But on the left hand side, uh, all the uh, all the charges uh, under the symmetry appears in my low energy. But on the right hand side, only those uh, charge neutral uh, states are appear in my low energy. So then it leads to Apu's question. Do we lose knowledge of symmetry charge states from using this uh, um, um, boundary of topological order? And the answer is no. Actually, the spectrum of those charge states is in another super selection sector. So that leads to this uh, 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 topic, this topological lines in the bulk. So we, in this case, we'll consider that the bulk is not totally in a ground state. We're going to have it in another fixed point limit so that there is a single topological excitations, which we call A in, in this case. And then uh, it still, there's no dynamics in the, in the bulk. The only information is that there's a topological excitation sitting somewhere there, uh, like uh, stationarily. And then through, through space time, it becomes a topological line in the bulk. And we're still going to have a boundary model that describes the dynamics of excitations on the boundary. And the previous case I care about is the case that when the A is in equals to vacuum, so the, uh, the bulk is the ground state. So this is the way I can insert the topological lines in the bulk. And then, we will see that if we choose this line to be this uh, E anion, a particular anion in toric code, then what shows up on the uh, boundary at a critical point will be this uh, U equals to minus one sector, this uh, Z2 op sector. And uh, this recovers the knowledge of uh, ice in conformal field theory with states uh, carrying Z2 charge. But then there's also further uh, sectors. In particular, if you insert this uh, M sector, on uh, uh, this M line in the bulk, you have this uh, mu states, some other states that uh, usually don't show up in uh, a transverse icing model criticality, but it's still it's a uh, one state in the uh, icing conformal field theory. And then even more intriguingly, if you have this F sector, which is a bound state of E and M particle, the low energy state will have this kind of form. You have some right moving uh, fermions and left moving fermions. So what are these two sectors? Is that we are getting more information using those correspondence than we are using symmetries to uh, describe uh, conformal field theories? The answer is not. Because on the symmetry side, we actually know more about uh, uh, CFT than we the way we traditionally used to describe it. In this case, we will have so-called symmetry lines in space-time. So, so we prepare our uh, critical points uh, with this uh, uh, on this torus that describes some, by some low energy spectrum. This is the first uh, first picture I showed here. Here, then we can do a lot of things with this symmetry. First, we can perform a symmetry transformation. And in space time, that means we insert a line at a particular time along the spatial direction. This G is a particular uh, symmetry uh, transformation in my group G. And then, and then uh, this will modify my uh, partition function. That means uh, uh, not only this uh, time evolution part, I will also uh, uh, insert a symmetry action. And then that's modify my low energy spectrum. So I can record it by um, this partition function, which is twisted by a symmetry line along the uh, uh, horizontally. And then uh, another thing I can do is I can insert a symmetry defects. Um, in, in condensed matter, what we mean is that uh, we will change the boundary condition of our Hilbert space. Once we insert this defect, then any states that are crossing this particular location 
in my uh, one-dimensional chain. It will get acti uh, acted by the symmetry G and then get equivalent to, uh, to the other side of the uh, fields. So I have this, uh, I can impose this, uh, insert this uh, symmetry defect by imposing a particular boundary condition. We call this a G defect. And since, uh, and what it does is like, it will totally change the, my allowed states in my Hilbert space. So it means that I'm still doing this pass integral in my partition function, but I will do it within a totally different uh, Hilbert space that has a different boundary condition. And finally, uh, I can do um, both of them. I can insert the symmetry defect uh, as well as doing a symmetry transformation. That means I insert uh, two lines, one horizontally, one vertically. And I'll have my final uh, partition function depending on the uh, symmetry lines um, along both directions. So in essence, uh, when I say there are actions of symmetry lines in space-time, I, mean, uh, uh, I mean on the here, uh, on this uh, quantum models, either doing a global symmetry transformation or insert a uh, symmetry defect. So for example, still take that uh, Ising criticality case. If I do not, uh, insert no lines, I have this uh, icing conformal field theory with uh, three states at the low energy. And then if I insert this uh, Z2 action, uh, because one of the states, it carries the uh, Z2 charge. So under this uh, action, it will uh, acquire a minus one sign. And then if I insert a defect, that means I will change the boundary condition of my transverse icing model from periodic boundary condition to anti-periodic boundary condition. And then in this uh, new uh, Hilbert space, my low energy state will be that mu states and this uh, left and right moving fermion states. And Linda, then- there's a question in a chat by Ken Kikuchi. And the question is, is the correspondence also true for anomaly too? And a poor yes, just it, answered. It, yeah. Pretty it is also true. I will describe it in, in general cases later in this talk. Of uh, in our papers, we describe this anomalous Z two case very precisely. And the quick answer is this: anomalous Z two symmetry will correspond to this so called double semion or twisted Z two topological order. Okay, I think it like a proof cat already answered it. Great. Okay, let's move on. So then we have two types of different lines that People can- People are asking more questions. If you can, please just unmute yourself. Um, there's a question, what does the mu mean here? Uh, okay. Mu is another low energy state uh, that appear in the uh, conformal field theory. Um, it has a, essentially it's the operator that insert a, um, a domain wall in the, in the IC model. And in CFT, you will find that it's almost, uh, say the scaling dimension is the same, same as this uh, sigma, uh, sigma, uh, sigma states. Yeah, it, it's just another local, a lo local state that appear in uh, CFT. Okay, so we now see that the conformal field theory can be acted by two types of uh, lines. One is the symmetry lines, the other is topological lines. And then through this example, you, I like I work out all the low energy spectrum. You will find that these two, uh, uh, two sectors of uh, conformal field theory, they're not, uh, they're not independent, they're related. They almost contain the same amount of information because this uh, left vector partition functions twisted by symmetries and the right hand side uh, conformal field theory twisted by topological lines, they are related by the spaces transformation. Exactly. And so that's my um, first main message that uh, this uh, 
this uh, correspondence between symmetry lines and topological lines is a generic feature about uh, is a uh, works for all uh, examples. So uh, more concretely, I'm trying to say that CFT, uh, if it has a symmetry, it can be then be acted by a symmetry lines. Then to describe the CFT completely, we'll use this vector passion function, and it has depending uh, it, it write it in, in this uh, symmetry twisted basis. Um, and then if the CFT is on a, uh, is uh, appear on the boundary of a topological order, it can also be acted by topological lines. And in this case, we'll uh, uh, describe it by a vector passion function in this uh, so-called quasi-particle basis. So these A's are all those uh, topological excitations that can appear in the box. And then the main message is that these two vector partition functions, they are just related by a basis transformation. There are some unitary matrix that maps uh, this uh, symmetry twisted basis to the qu quasi-particle basis. So that means that these two vector of partition functions, they encode the same amount of information. Anything you know from the left-hand side, you know from the right-hand side and vice versa. And um, I will later, I will show like precisely what is this uh, basic transformation, um, but it's a, it's a bit technical. So I, I leave it for later. But uh, the, quick, uh, uh, the quick example is that you can think this block is, um, uh, G, is, um, is in some deconfined phase of uh, G gauge theory. So this is some um, G topological orders. And why we have this basis transformation because the boundary of those, uh, uh, the boundary of topological orders, once you put different uh, any on A in the box, a collection of these, uh, uh, these states are going to be the same as another uh, Hilbert space appearing when you twist it by a G defects. So there's this, uh, formal relation between the Hilbert space of the two sides that you can work out also at mi microscopically. That's why these two, uh, two vector partition functions just uh, encodes the same amount of information. So yeah, so that's uh, my uh, first, what's the point? Uh, that's my first part of my talk. So in, I show you that we can trust this uh, correspondence at microscopic level. And then at macroscopic level, one lesson we learn is that uh, uh, actions of symmetry lines and action of the topological lines, they are essentially the same. And now let me move on to talk about how we can use this correspondence to predict dynamics in a quantum system with the symmetry. And as a condensed matter physicist, we care the most the, the phase diagram imposed by the symmetry. And to uh, solve this, I want to show you that we uh, first uh, derive the uh, boundary uh, phase diagram of topological orders, and then use that to infer the phase diagram in system with symmetries. And in particular, I will apply to cases that the, there are some phase transitions that cannot be explained by Landau theories. So let me begin with a little bit uh, background. So in our case that traditionally, most of the phase transitions involve symmetries, we can describe it using Landau theories. So Landau theory describes transitions from a so-called disorder phase to an order phase. So it means that if your Hamiltonian has a global symmetry G, then you will at least have two types of phases. One is the disorder phase, the symmetry, it's not broken in the ground state. The ground state is symmetric under the symmetry. And uh, in physical picture, it means this is a condensate of domain walls. And then there's another type of state is what we call the order state. And with a symmetry transformation, when X on the ground state, it's a transformed the ground state to another state. So the symmetry is broken in the ground state. And this state usually it's a condensate of uh, in charges. And then the Landau theory says that because these two states behave so differently under symmetries, there must be a phase transition in between. And then uh, a further case that Landau theory can describe is, uh, 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 is that uh, this order phase, it might not break the whole uh, G symmetry. 
it might break only break the symmetry G down to a smaller symmetry H. So H is a subgroup of G and the ground state is the invariant under the action of H. And then essentially, uh, uh, this is still a symmetry breaking transition like the broken symmetry is the quotient of uh, G over H. So this can still be described by the Landau theory. Then there comes to a case that cannot be explained by the Landau theory is that if you're on the both, uh, on the both hand side, you have two order phase. Say you have a Hamiltonian that has this uh, G1 times G2 as a global symmetry. And then in one phase, uh, G, G, G1 is broken and G2 is unbroken. On the other hand, the two is reversed. If this uh, the two symmetry G1 and G2 are totally unrelated, then this is this can still be described by Landau's theory. It's just uh, two different separate uh, Landau transition associated with uh, G1 and G2 separately. But that would be very fine tuned. And the interesting case is that this uh, G1 and G2 is somewhat inter intertwined. So once the G1 symmetry is broken, it uh, it must uh, it must means that the G2 is unbroken. So this uh, when the G uh, so this two symmetry are just uh, connected with each other. And then when the situation is reversed, uh, when G1 is unbroken, it necessarily means that G2 is broken. So this transition is no longer fine tuned. And uh, this kind of uh, cases does happen in some examples in quantum magnets. In that, for example, in that case, the symmetry we are care about mostly is like say the SO3 spin rotation symmetry times some lattice rotation symmetry. And um, you, uh, there's a big story that people how to describe that uh, phase transition in this case, but. Uh, for our talk, let me show you the simplest. So, there's a question okay. in the chat uh, by Hao Shu. Is it essential that symmetry group G used here is abelian? Uh, well, at this correspondence, we think it uh, it works uh, regardless of that G is uh, abelian or not. But the um, the isomorphic I proved. Um, it works for non-abelian G in the 1D, 2D correspondence. I didn't work out the this the isomorphism at the higher dimensions. Uh, I think the setup can be generalized straightforwardly, but there's too many details that that case. But a lot of statement about the sy sy uh, sy symmetry charges and symmetry defects and how this correspond, like there's a dictionary between low energy excitations. That doesn't depend on that the symmetry is, uh, is a billion. Okay. So let me describe this uh, simplest Landau transition. It happens already in a 1D system and the, sim uh, and the symmetry is the simplest case you can imagine. This is Z2 times Z2 symmetry. And how it can intertwine this to Z2 symmetry is that we can think about a case that there's uh, what we call mixed anomaly between the two Z2 symmetries. And in condensed matter terms, that means that when we create a symmetry domain wall of this uh, first Z2 symmetry, on these two domain walls, each domain wall carries a fractional charge under the second Z2 symmetry. And then in more high energy setting, we call this anomaly is characterized by a three co cycle. It's uh, some uh, some three cycles that uh, sends uh, Z2 times Z2 to U1. And uh, more concretely, we can describe this uh, co-cycle also through using a uh, SPT order. So this is a, a topological invertible topological phase described by a in, by a multi, a multi component Simons uh, Simons. Uh, action and this A and uh, this big A's are some background U1 gauge field. And then this particular K matrix describe this SPT uh, order and also describe this anomaly that happens on the boundary of this SPT order. 
uh, this cocycle essentially means that uh, it comes from this minus one sign. It uh, talks about some mutual statistics between two uh, domain wall. The domain wall of Z1 and Z2, they're not, uh, they're not separate. There's mutual statistics between the two. Okay, so then uh, we can also describe that anomaly using the fusion rules. As I said that each of this uh, domain wall of the first type carries a fractional charge. It's actually half the Z2 charge of the second symmetry. So that means if we have two of these domain walls, they carry a whole charge under the second symmetry. And in terms of fusion rules, that means that uh, with uh, domain, wall, uh, domain wall one times domain wall one equals to charge two. And uh, similarly, there's a relation for reverse the types. So that's enough. We can use this anomaly to constrain the dynamics because uh, this fusion rule means that if we have uh, domain wall one condensed, then its bound state is also condensed. So it means that if domain wall one is condensed, the charge of the, is, is the second symmetry is also going to be condensed. And when the domain wall condensed means that the symmetry is unbroken. And when the, uh, when the charge is condensed means that the symmetry uh, is, is broken. So we will have this, uh, this uh, phase diagram. On the one hand uh, side, it's uh, one symmetry is broken, the other must be unbroken. On the other hand, the situation is reversed. And then you can ask, what about the transition? What is the, is this the direct transition? Is this the first order, second order? And if it's second order, what, what's the field theory describing it? And just use the an anomaly. We're not able to predict these dynamics on the, uh, at the transition. So now let me apply this correspondence to solve this problem. So as I said that this anomaly is captured by SPT order, but then it also means that the corresponding topological order of this uh, quantum chain with this uh, uh, anomalous Z2 times Z2 symmetry is this uh, twisted Z2 times Z2 gauge theory. It's uh, the action looks a bit similar to the SPT order, but now this um, gauge field A becomes some dynamic gauge field. So this becomes a topological ordered system and the K matrix still stays the same. And then you can read out from this K matrix that we are have uh, four types of topological excitations, E1, E2, M1, M2. And using the K matrix, you can also work out this fusion rules, M1 times M1 equals to E2, and uh, others just follows. And you can see very quickly, there's a dictionary between the topological excitations and the uh, low energy excitations associated with the symmetries, especially this uh, charge under the first symmetry becomes this uh, topological uh, excitation E1 in the, uh, in the gauge theory. And the domain wall becomes this uh, M type uh, topological excitation, the flux and others also follows. Uh, go ahead, someone ask some questions. Just to make sure, so earlier slide you say when DW1 domain wall condense, the Q2 charge condense, do you mean half of Q2 or just Q2? Or the, the, the Q2? Because two of the D, DW1 fuse to Q2, has a Q2 charge, right? So is, should, I, should that be half I mean of the whole? The, I mean the yeah. whole Q2 will condense because D, uh, uh, domain wall condense means that the bound state of it also condense and the bound state of it is the Q2. And the, but, the, but the, the fractional charge does not condense, is it? I just want to confirm that point. That's half. Well, that depending on how you, it, it's a phrase. You can say half charge is condensed when the whole charge is also condensed. Because the domain wall already carries a half charge. Once the domain wall one is condensed, it does in the same time means that this half charge is condensed. So, so the ground state, by condensed means the ground state sandwiched by the Q2 of fractional Q2 operator that takes non-trivial expectation value, right? The, 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 the condensate is non-zero. So I, I, I want to confirm whether yeah, it's yeah. Half, 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 half of the quotient, half charge well, of the quotient. You say, well, I didn't show you how to 
write the operator that create this domain wall and charge. But the generate uh, the creation operator for domain wall, it already carries a fractional charge under the second symmetry. And this creation operator needs to be uh, have some non-expect uh, non-zero expectation values. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll take the fractional charge also condensed there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, then use that dictionary between low energy excitations, we can like fill in this phase diagram. So on this uh, left hand side, when Q1 DW2 is condensed means that this uh, on the boundary of this uh, twisted uh, topological order, this E1 and M2 will condense together. And on the right hand, E2 and M1 condense together. So the problem that the young Landau transition becomes, how can we work how the phase transition between these two condensate happening on the boundary of this twisted uh, topological order? And to now we are still a bit clue, uh, clueless, uh, like how, how, how to find out this one. Then we need some knowledge. Uh, some, uh, there's a question. I see a raised up hand. Mm -hmm. There's also an old question in the chat, which is how the anomalous CFT and anomaly free CFT isomorphic. They're not, uh, they're in general, they're not. Let, sorry, I cannot see the chat. How the anomalous CFT and anomalous free CFT are anomalous. Uh, they're not. CFT with anomalous symmetry and CFT with uh, anonymous uh, symmetry in most cases, they're just different. Um, the isomorphic I, I mentioned is always uh, a CFT appearing in the one D mod uh, in the one D model, and the CFT appearing on the boundary of a topological order model. Okay, so to find out the phase transition, we need some knowledge of top of top topological orders. Essentially, this twisted Z2 times Z2 gauge theory is actually exactly equivalent to Z4 gauge theory. So through a basis transformation of, uh, of this uh, K matrix, there's some, some transformation that shows what two K matrix is describing the same topological order. And using that, you'll find this uh, K matrix will be tr uh, transformed into another K matrix this uh, two-dimensional K matrix times a trivial trivial part. So it means that the topological contents of this two theory are, ex are equivalent. So in particular, in terms of Z2, Z4 gauge theory, the topological excitation are generated by this uh, single e, part, e type and single M type. And the fusion rule is uh, this Z4 type, uh, E to the fourth power equals one, M to the fourth power equals one. And then use that uh, transformation on K matrix. You can also work out a dictionary between those excitations. So this uh, E1 is actually correspond to uh, EQ, uh, e, e square in Z4 uh, gauge theory. And this uh, M1 um, a top, uh, excitation correspond to a single M on the Z2 side. And then that means that this is the same phase diagram, uh, phase diagram also appear on the boundary of Z4 topological order. And you can translate through that dictionary that on the left hand side, we have a single E condensed. And single E condensed means E square is also condensed and uh, E square is uh, just this uh, E1 uh, in the twisted Z2 language. And then on the right hand side, we have a uh, single, uh, uh, this uh, single M is condensed. So this boundary, this transition will happen between a pure charge condensate and pure flux condensate. And that is almost there, we're almost there. And then this boundary of Z2 topological order, using that correspondence, we know that this is also equivalent to a model with Z4 symmetry in a single quantum chain. And then this single E condensed phase will be mapped to this uh, Z4 symmetry breaking phase where this Z4 charge condense. 
And this M condensate will be mapped to this uh, Z4 symmetric state where this uh, Z4 domain wall condense. So then we have got the solution because this, uh, this uh, phase transition happened in this uh, Z2, Z4 quantum chain. It's just a, a, a symmetry breaking transition. So we can learn from Landau theory that this universality class is the same as the Z4 pulse model. And we can also work out that the low energy, uh, low energy theory is described by this uh, U1 conformal field theory. So we have solved this uh, transition. So the so, uh, so the the answer is that this this two uh, this uh, transition between two order phase there it's a continuous phase transition described by U one CFT. So let me ref, uh, reflect a bit how we how we get our answer. We start with a model with a anomalous uh, Z two times Z two symmetry. Then we apply this correspondence a couple of times. We first map it to the boundary of this twisted topological order. And then we mapped it to a boundary of Z4 topological order. And then finally, we mapped it back to a one dimensional model with a Z4 symmetry. But all the statement I make, it's a non perturbative statement that I don't know, I need to know any more micro spot details about this, uh, this models. And I already got an answer that it's, we are pretty confident about. So, Yes. So, so, so say you didn't know about the universality class of the transition in the Z4 model. Uh, can you use the some data of the topological order to still constrain uh, the the universality class of the of transitions? Maybe the operator content or something. Uh, Actually, we can. Uh, but the 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 techniques we do that is uh it's a bit le more less familiar. So essentially, this is the e-condensed about like this is a gap state uh, with some anion condensed. This is another gap state with another anion condensed. So in terms of topological order, this is called a this collection of anions that condense and um, becomes a gap state. It's what we call this uh, Lagrangian sub sub algebra. So. Once you have a topological order, you can work out what set of anions can condense together, and the and the max, maximum set of it forms a Lagrangian. So once they condense, they become a gap state. And then if you are not you find a collection of anions that can condense, but they doesn't form a mac, uh, mac, mac, uh, maximal uh, collection. That is some uh, con condensation that's still in a gapless phase. And those gapless phases are at the uh, transition between those gap states. And there's a way to work out like between these two gap states, what is the anions are condensed at this transition. And then using that anion, uh, uh, condensed anions, we can uh, then solve this uh, transition using that vector passion function. Um, condensed anions means that this is uh, this is some condensate, some ground state. So some components of that vector of passion function become zero, and some others are still like gap uh, contains the gapless size state changes. And we can there's a way to solve that vector of passion functions, and that tells you what kind of uh, uh, conformal field theory can appear uh, at this transition. So there's a systematic way to do that. Um, it's described in Xiao Gang's paper, recent paper. I see. Thanks. So uh, I think it should be a Z2 gauging of the U1 CFT. Uh, Z2 right? gauging? Yeah, Z Z2 gauging of the Z4 symmetry inside the U1 CFT. Well, um, well, because your microscopic model already already had this Z2 gauged, well, that's why you had a Z2 times Z2 symmetry rather than Z4. Uh, so well, the model has to start with a Z2 times Z2 symmetry and then the bulk with the anomalous and then the bulk can be an SPT order and then you can gauge the whole system 
then the bulk become a Z4 Z4 system, and the the boundary becomes a, a gauged Z4 system. Um, yes. I'm saying one way to manufacture Z2 times Z2 symmetry with this anomaly is to begin with Z4 without anomaly and gauging that uh, Z2 subgroup. Okay, that 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 I I think that can also be a way to have this Z2 times Z2 symmetry. Right. So at this transition point as well, you will have to gauge this Z2 subgroup. Yeah, I think so. But then you still have this U1 CFT. Uh, yeah, but with the Z2 gauged, a Z2 yeah. global symmetry gauged. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, that finished my application. I think I'm already running out of time. I'm okay, like stop here. But if you want me, I can also add um, more. You, you uh, can take some more time if you if you like. Maybe just uh, just describe a few things quickly. So uh, first, I have talked about this like, equivalence between symmetry lines and topological lines in the most basic setting, and then there's also a little bit more complicated setting. And uh, the first is that when this uh, symmetry can be anomalous, how we deal with that. And in particular, I let me show you that uh, this basis transformation will be something like this. So this left-hand side is this anion basis. And anions can be like further written in terms of uh, symmetry flux, this G flux, and uh, the residual representation under this uh, residual symmetries. And the right-hand side with this uh, symmetry twisted basis. But the main message is that this, this matrix that uh, relates these two bases, it's actually, it's just some character tables of the symmetry. So when this uh, G is not anomalous, high appearing here is almost just the character tables of the G group and, the, and its subgroups. And when a symmetry is anomalous, this chi, it's uh, just the projective representation. It's the pro uh, this projective character tables of those uh, symmetries. So these things are just, uh, you just need to know about the symmetry to work out this uh, basis transformation. And that says that this uh, equivalence holds for both anomalous symmetries and non-anomalous symmetries. And there's more complicated case, which I won't talk about. I just mentioned the result. Like if you already start with a CFT that happens on the boundary of a topological order, and in many cases, this topological order can be further enriched by another symmetry. For example, in toric code, you can further have EM exchange symmetry. And once that happens, your CFT is like going to be acted by both topological lines and symmetry lines. And then, uh, this correspondence means that you can further gauge the symmetry, this uh, G symmetry, and find another topological order. So you have a set of uh, topological lines that acts on the, uh, on the CFT. There's no symmetry lines anymore. And then in this setting, this left-hand side is the CFT appearing on the boundary of some SET order. On the right hand is some CFT that appearing on the boundary of some topological order. This uh, basis transformation, it's a uh, still holds. So the actions of uh, the combination of symmetry and topological lines can still be translated into pure, uh, actions of pure topological lines. Okay, uh, that's the main part of my talk. And finally, I can ha have some little comments about uh, another setting that's appeared um, and get popular recently. It's uh, proposed by uh, these three gentlemen. And to the leading order, their statement is the same as ours, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, a completely description of symmetries, it's a topological field theory. But the concrete geometry they describe this, it's a bit different, especially they use this uh, sandwich geometry. So they consider, a, for example, a two-dimensional system in the bulk, then it has two boundaries, a left boundary and a right boundary. And they will put the bulk uh, into some uh, some model described by a TQFT, and they will fix the right boundary to this uh, uh, fix the gap boundary, 
So conventionally, it's called this uh, Dirichlet boundary. You can the the canonical example is that you can think that all the charged quasi particles, this all the pure charge and uh, topological excitations are all condensed on this boundary, and it's guaranteed that this boundary is a gap one. And then on the left hand side, you're free to choose any boundaries. So there are going to be dynamics on the left boundaries. And what they claim is that this uh, pair of bulk B and the fixed boundary R, they together act as symmetries. And then this uh, uh, three piece together, um, two boundaries together with the bulk, they together form a quasi one dimensional quantum system. And this, how they describe the action of uh, symmetries on a QFT. And how that's kind of related to ours. So let's translate their setting to our language. So we are always work with this uh, solid torus geometry. We have a topological line, a bulk, and the bulk is completely in some fixed, a fixed a limit, no dynamics. And we call this a topological order bulk. Then this gap to reach this boundary condition in our language will be a particular boundary that this all pure charge are condensed. So it described with this a vector partition functions that once there are uh, for those sectors with pure uh, associated with pure charges in the box, we put a one in front of it. And for all those other sectors, we put zero uh, in front of it. So this describes a gap boundary. And then our dynamic boundary will, will be this generic um, uh, boundary described by this generic um, vector passion functions. Then how we get this through this uh, two types of boundaries, uh, one dimensional system, we can take the overlap of these two vector passion functions, this dynamic boundary and um, how it's overlapped with this Dirichlet boundary. And then what it does is to sum over all the pure charge sectors in my dynamic boundaries. And using the knowledge of CFTs, we can show that this is a single partition function. There's no vector anymore. It's just a single function. It always describes a one plus one D model with a symmetry. And when this partition function is described some critical theories, this is always a modular environment CFT. So it's a totally legitimate uh, CFT describing purely one dimensional systems. So the lesson is that we take the overlap between this fixed boundary and any dynamic boundary, we can output a pure one dimension, uh, one dimensional, um, we can output a partition function describing purely one dimensional system. Yeah, so that's what we, what we compare. And then recently there's a follow-up about this uh, sandwich geometry and they just uh, decompose it, what, what it really happens in the box. And uh, essentially they, they were still like working with this vector passion functions with uh, different any inserted in the, in the box. So at that level, it seems these two settings are doing quite similar things. Uh, the whole main mes uh, message from both settings that by coupling the system to a 2D topological uh, block, we can get a lot more information about symmetries and especially all the actions generated by those symmetry lines are also all captured by the actions of topological lines. So that's my talk today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask Wenji. Oh, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, why the partition function is a vector of the, uh, not, uh, with the so, uh, sol solid torus? Oh, uh, that's, uh, that's why, maybe I go to quote there. Um, so initially, we don't have a vector partition function. We have a single partition function describe the boundary of the topological order when the bulk is uh, in the vac uh, in the ground state. And then we can think about inserting different topological excitations in the bulk. So we insert some topological lines in this space-time. 
And if this is a different bo bo box state, it will have different boundary dynamics. So to describe the boundary dynamics of this setting, we'll have another component of partition functions. And then we think about all these different cases, they form a vector partition function. Uh, but the, uh, when you insert the symmetry defect, the partition function is also a vector. So uh, each of them are modular invariant or uh, transforms under the modular transformation? Oh, great question. Um, so let's say this example, the left-hand side is twisted by symmetries. Only the top one is invariant under modular transformation. This Z11 component is modular invariant. Once you insert other uh, symmetry lines along different directions, it's no longer modular invariant. So they are not really, yeah, they're just not. But on the other hand, then, if you sum over all the left-hand side, and if the symmetry is not anomalous, you'll get another modular invariant partition function. That's, that's essentially what you're doing is gauge this uh, Z2 symmetry. So if the symmetry is non-anomalous, you're guaranteed to, you're able to gauge it, and then the after the gauging, your CFT, since it's also described by a 1D model without any insertion of defects, it's also a modular invariance. So the quick answer is that this left-hand side, only this top components in modular invariant. On the right-hand side, none of them are modular invariant, but both-hand side, they're modular covariant and they're also related. Uh, so I'm still puzzled about uh, this correspondence because the left hand side is the uh, safety without without the bulk, but the right hand side is the uh, safety with the bulk. So uh, I'm still puzzled why these two are corresponded. Um. So first of all, on the right hand side, even though it's uh, so some boundary that's coupled to a bulk, but there are no dynamics on the in the bulk. So whatever states appearing in this low uh, this CFT, it's only describe some states appearing on the boundary of this uh, uh, of this model. So the so so the the only role of this bulk is to set some global constraint on this uh, boundary. So this system is still, you can think of the, this as a system of one dimension because all the dynamics happen in the one dimension. And on the left-hand side, there's a CFT, some low energy states also describe some one dimensional systems. So if you just, uh, what, what is CFT? It doesn't tell you like what, where, these uh, operate like local excitations are created by what low what microscopic um, um, models. What it all tells you is this uh, this spectrum. So for each particular state, what's the momentum and what's the energy? So this uh, formal partition function can describe any one dimensional system. So in this in our case, it can on one hand describe one D model with symmetry. Another is the boundary model of uh, topological order. And this correspondence says that the spectrum, so this uh, P, J, Epsilon, J, these values are corresponding. And so that, that's how we read this through this uh, spectrum. And then we'll also like try to explain it at microscopic level. We can find this isomorphism between the uh, between the two sides. So on the left side, the creation operators of symmetry charges and symmetry domain walls is going to be mapped to another operators on the right hand side that creates those uh, topological excitations on the boundary. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah. So. Yeah, so thank you for the very nice talk, Manjia. Uh, so something I was wondering is you, you mentioned that the symmetry topological order correspondence works for any discrete symmetry. 
Um, well, do you know what the topological order would be if I had an internal Z symmetry? No, uh, it's a fine. I'm talking about finite discrete symmetry. Okay, I see. Okay. Okay, okay. thank you. Do you have some thoughts on how to incorporate spatial symmetries into this uh, framework? I think if spatial symmetry is some discrete spatial symmetry, uh, like D4 rotation symmetry, it's likely that we can still incorporate it in this framework because even though like microscopy looks like a spatial symmetry, in terms of field theories, it's still some internal finite symmetry. So if we only care about comparison between those low energy excitations, we can work lattice discrete symmetry the same way as the internal discrete symmetry. But, but constructing lattice models with those spatial symmetries would, I guess, be more complicated, right? Yeah, that I think so. But if you only want to have like lattice symmetry and internal symmetry, and there's a mixed anomaly between them. If all the symmetries are uh, discrete, we can still use this correspondence to find like what topological orders they can talk you, you're talking about, and the phase diagram still maps. Just a uh, yeah, microstop level on the left hand side is a bit complicated. So uh, in your example, uh, there was that we studied about Z2 times Z2 symmetry with anomaly. So one of the phases was Z4 completely broken. The, the other phase was Z4 completely unbroken. And you described that the transition is Z4 Potts model. But there mm -hmm. is another phase that I can consider, which is Z2, only Z2 subgroup being spontaneously broken. Yes. And now I have two more transitions that I can think about. So I have right. fully Z4 broken with uh, with this one or fully Z4 and broken with this one. Do you know what the transition in, in these cases is? Uh, yeah, these are in terms of Z4, there are also some Landau type transition where you just break some uh, Z4, Z2 subgroup of it. Um, it's described completely in, in Xiaogang Akia's paper. You have a complete map of this, complete phase diagram of this uh, model with Z2 times Z2 symmetry and also how it maps to the Z4 cases. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Monji. Thanks for the nice talk. I uh, just follow the uh, Lakshaw's comment. Uh, let's see. So, uh, in, in, let's see how to say it. So, in the, in the case of this uh, Z2 times Z2 symmetry, in 1 plus 1D with anomaly. Uh, can you somehow map to the Z4 symmetry system in one possibility? Is there still an anomaly? Or is uh, no anomaly? Well, in the Z4 cases, there's no anomaly. But 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 the original motivation in the Z2 breaking either of the Z2 will map, somehow have the was underlying anomaly maps to the corresponding to this uh, uh, decomposing quantum critical point at the phase transition. And when you go to Z4, is there something that you can also make a comment? And, and also that the, whether there's also additional Z2 bleep symmetry make the symmetry group, like the hydro group order eight, is there something like that in the Z4 symmetry system? Yeah, uh, maybe, let me yeah. Answer I, I the first I question first. Okay. The first question is like, like the whole point of this uh, deconfined criticality is that there's a mixed anomaly between the two symmetry. So now we have become like get another model with the Z4 symmetry since there's no, no anomaly there. So I think the lesson is that in this, like these examples, there is a mixed anomaly because we didn't find the right generators of those excitations. We saw the generators, it's this uh, domain walls and uh, charges, but then they're intertwined, like they're not separate. 
And then if you find the right generators, which is now in terms of these four uh, topological excitations, they just you just separate this topological excitations in two separate class, pure charge class and pure flux charge classes. And then in terms of these degree form, there's no anomaly. So at least for this example, it shows that some of the anomaly you can describe in terms of more simple generator of excitations and then you don't, there's no anomaly anymore. Uh, the se second question, can you ask it again? Like, are you yes. want so, to? Yeah, so so let me just try to say how I understand. Uh, you try to make the deconfined quantum criticality critical point that was underlying Z2 times Z2 symmetry anomaly into a, another critical point without, oh, well, that, that's, that's within Landau, right? You are map what people call beyond Landau to within Landau by changing the symmetry group, is it? Oh, well, yes, yes. Yes, yes, uh, okay. But, but then there's also a way to say this by thinking about the Z2 times Z2 uh, symmetry with anomaly in one plus one B can be trivialized by some uh, symmetry extension. And that I think require a dihedral group of order eight, where the Z4 is the part of the Z4 you described, but there's also a semi-direct Z2 somewhere. And in that case, then the, the anomaly for that, the what Z2 times Z2 become trivialized once you extend to a larger Hilbert space uh, with the DA symmetry. And I, I think that DA contains a Z4, which is part of the Z4 you discussed. And there could be additional Z2 somewhere. I guess that's the point of view I take. I see. I see. That's yeah. another, I guess that's another interesting way to solve this problem. Yes. So you can map something, this system was anomaly by symmetry extension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, that's it. Well, the, as one thing I like our approach is that there's no, there's no less assumption. <laughs> well, of course, there's assumption that corresponds some topological order bulk. But other than that, I don't need to be like clever enough to talk, think about a, a, another symmetry to, to extend, to embed this Z2 times Z2. Like other way I do is some like like maps from one correspondence to another correspondence. It's uh it's like one operation I do many times. This it needs less me of me to be clever. Yeah. All right. But in any case, thanks very much. I, I think I'll ask uh, individually. Thank you. Okay, that's more Thank you. Thank you. Hi, so I, I have another question. Um, so in, in the previous slide um, with the Z2 times Z2 anomalous case, mm -hmm. uh, could you go to the previous slide, please? Sorry. Uh, yeah, this one, cool. Uh, so one way, is, is it true that one way I can think of the, the fact that it's, it's uh, like I could have this Z4 bound, uh, bulk topological order is that I start with this anomalous Z2 times Z2 uh, symmetry in like a one plus one D theory, I extend that to a two plus one D theory and I gauge like some Z2 subgroup and I get the Z4 symmetry. Right. Um, I'm sorry, can you say it again? Oh yeah, so um, so if, yeah, uh, so the, the phase diagram here, it seems to like there's this correspondence between like the, the symmetry breaking patterns of the anomalous Z2 times Z2 and the symmetry breaking patterns of the Z4, right? And mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I guess one way I'm, I'm understanding that is uh, I can start with this anomalous Z2, Z2 times Z2, and I could just gauge uh, the Z2 subgroup. And then the, the anomaly becomes a group extension, and that is Z, you get a Z4 symmetry after you gauge the Z2 subgroup. Mm, that's not the way I'm doing it here. The way I do, do it is more like I have this anomalous symmetry, so I know I should couple it to a SPD order with this anomalous Z2 times Z2 symmetry. Mm -hmm. And then I have this uh, 2D model with a 1D boundary. There's no anomaly of the symmetry anymore. I can totally gauge the both the Z2 symmetry. And mm -hmm. once I do that, I will get this uh, twisted gauge theory, which is the same as this uh, Z4 gauge theory. Okay. Yeah. So I, I guess, yeah, I think that's the same thing. Um, I think, my, well, my question is, is, is whether or not the, 
because you're always working in the symmetric sector. So when you, you're gauging the symmetry doesn't uh, change. Uh, yeah, you can like say two, two models are dual just by gauging because you're only caring about the symmetric subsector of the Hilbert space, right? Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is like if if the bulk topological order is always uh is always unique. Uh is because like uh with the z2 times z2 case, there's only one thing you can gauge. You can only yeah, you there's like you you can write down the SPK in one higher dimension and gauge the z2 subgroup, and then you get the topological order. But I guess what I'm wondering is like suppose you have like an anomalous z2 times z4. So then you have this like z2 times z4 SPT in, in the two plus one d case. And it seems like you could gauge either the Z2 subgroup or the Z4 subgroup. And naively, I, I think you'd get two different topological orders. Uh, I don't know if of I'm course. making sense, but. Of course, you can just, uh, first of all, you you have all the normally only one, you're in a purely 1D system. So you cannot gauge all the symmetry altogether. Once you couple to SPT, you're always allowed to gauge all the symmetry group. And then you can also say that, can I take an intermediate step, only gauge part of the symmetry? In that case, I will have a topological order enriched by a symmetry. So my boundary will be some critical point described by both symmetry lines and topological lines. And then I can keep ga gauging the remaining symmetry. I get a pure topological order in the bulk. All these uh, topological order, all as a uh, symmetry enriched topological, you get in the immediate, uh, uh, in, in immediate steps, they can all be used to describe the boundary of this critical point. But in general, if you gauge everything and get a pure topological order, since it's most simplified. Okay, good. I see. So you could do this like partial gauging, like you're saying, and that you could also use that as a bulk. But the simplest case is to gauge everything. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. I have a comment uh, to Sal's uh, question, which is uh, that the gauging is actually directly on the boundary. So if you start with the Z4 model, you can gauge as valued in a three plus one D theory, which has a mixed zero form, one form anomaly. But but you in the bulk you can think of invertible domain walls and there is a invertible domain wall between a z two times z two topological order which is the double semion and the z four topological order. So they are equivalent in the sense that Ben J described. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so are there any... Okay, if not, let's let's thank Benji. Thank you for the nice talk.